Please remain standing for the reading of God's Word. Reading from John chapter 21, the first 19 verses. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana of Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon heard, Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat towing the net full of fish for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals. There were fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net shore and it was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This is now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of God, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself. And you went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you to where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. I want to say a brief word of welcome to those who are joining with us and worshiping with us online. We are so honored that you've welcomed us into your home and those who are worshiping with us via the televised broadcasts. It is something that we never take for granted and we hope if you're ever in the area you will come and worship with us. Next week I'm going to launch a brand new series. I've never preached a series, a group of messages at Dalton First. This will be my first time. In the month of August we're going to focus on the family. And so I want to invite you to join me next week when a new series called Bless This Home. Now here's the idea, guys. Anytime we launch a brand new series, it is a wonderful moment for you to be able to say, hey, our pastor's doing something new and launching a brand new series. Come this Sunday. Don't miss out on it. And so I want to invite you, especially as we get ready to roll into the fall and school starts to get back in session, invite somebody to come to this place, this place that has been a life-giving resource in your life. Uh, so, inside your worship guide, I want to invite you to turn there with me real quickly. There's an outline of today's message and the scripture that was just read. Uh, in your seat back in front of you is a pen that's always provided for you to be able to take notes and follow along. I hope maybe that you'll fill in some blanks, circle some scriptures, maybe even write in the margin some things that you want to hold on to after today's message. Well, I drive a Volvo. My wife drives a, an SUV. An American-made SUV. I don't know. I don't, I'm not going to tell you the 
the manufacturer of it, because here's why. I've been driving my Volvo for about six years, and I've never gotten a recall on it, but her American SUV, we get one about every year, all right? It's a little, and you know, you, this happens to you too, right? You go to the mailbox, and all of a sudden something has been recalled, and you've got to bring your vehicle in, and if you don't do it, it can be scary, right? In her recall, she's, we've had her vehicle for about six years, I think it's about every year, six times I've had to take her car into the shop for various things. Uh, one thing was the air conditioning system would not work right, it would fail, and they need to do something with the AC, but that was minor compared to an exhaust system that could set fire in the rear of the vehicle, right? You had to take that in there for that, and there was an issue with the brakes at one moment, there was an issue with the bumper at one moment. So we keep taking that vehicle back. You've done this before. Thankfully, they do the work for free, right? They're going to make it right. If they've had an issue, they're going to fix the issue that has been there. You know, the scripture that we read this morning is the third time Jesus appears after the resurrection. And some people call this Peter's recall moment. <laughs> His moment of being able to be reset, redirected, meeting with Jesus one more time and being brought back into the fold after, after denying Jesus three different times, after a moment of utter failure in his life. And you know what? I think this story for you and for me, it certainly has something to teach us about how God operates in our lives. And so as we dive into John chapter 21, I want you to not only hear Peter's story, but my hope for you this morning is that you would maybe think about some moments in your life where you've had a moment to reset things with God, a moment to be redirected, a moment to kind of put down an Ebenezer, if you will, and say, God met me here again and set me a new right, rekindled our relationship. It's certainly what happened with Peter. And by the way, Peter desperately needed it. You know, in your story, it says that uh, Peter had said to the disciples, I'm going to fish. Peter was a leader, and even, even when he's at his low spot, he's still leading. I'm going to fish. And the other disciples looked at him and said, we'll go with you. We'll go with you. There were six of them, by the way. Six of them went fishing that night, and they caught nothing all night long. By the way, that is one boring moment to fish through the night, and you don't catch anything, right? And frustrating to boot. Can you imagine if you're going to put yourself in Peter's place? You, you've, you've been in a hard place spiritually. Is there such a thing as being spiritually fatigued? Spiritually weary? I, I see Peter in that place. Probably dry, probably wounded, probably disappointed with himself and his own denial of the Messiah. And he's in this place and he can't even get good results from the fishing trip, right? Nothing is happening all night long. And then all of a sudden this figure appears in the wee hours of the morning. Says, friends, have you caught any fish? No, we haven't. And then you know the story, right? Throw the net on the right side of the boat. I love this moment in the scripture. Sometimes I see the scriptures like a movie. And evidently John was standing right next to Peter when all of a sudden they threw the nets over and the nets got full of fish. And John, the Bible calls him, he calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved, almost kind of whispers in Peter's ears, it's the Lord. Not another word had to be spoken in that moment. When Peter realized what John was saying was true and that Jesus was on that beach, Peter grabbed his garment, dove into the water, swam to the shore. And guys, I only wish I knew what happened in the next few minutes in that opening conversation. They're not recording the scripture. We don't know what that reunion was like when Peter was all alone with Jesus on the beach. But what we do know is when the other disciples showed up dragging this net of 153 fish that did not break the net. Did you catch that? The, the miracle that did not break the net. Jesus has got breakfast lined up, right? He's got a fire going. He says, bring the fish over. Nobody ever talks about where did the bread come from, right? And Jesus has breakfast prepared, but he has a lot more on his mind than just breakfast, right? And so Jesus, while they're having this meal, begins to ask these questions. I, I bet this is a pretty familiar scripture to you, maybe. 
where Jesus looks at Peter and says, do you love me? Peter says, yes, I love you. It's this intimate moment. Feed my lambs, feed my sheep. Three different times. A lot of scholars have made a lot about the fact that Jesus asked him those questions three times as a mirror to the denial that Peter made three different times. I don't know what's all built into that. But I hear Jesus' words. I'm sorry, I hear Peter's words. And Peter looks at him for the third time. And he says, Peter, do you love me? And hurt, Peter says, Jesus, you know everything. That takes me back to how many miracles he'd seen Jesus do. I mean, he knew that Jesus knew everything, right? And he says, you know everything. Why are you asking me this? And Peter look, Jesus looks at him and says, follow me, feed my lambs. Guys, there's this beautiful picture of how Peter is set back aright and set back anew that I hope you and I will take a few lessons from. So if you have your, mar- your outline in the, in the margin there or in the notes, I just want to point out a couple of simple things this morning. And the first thing I want us to take note of about this passage is notice what Jesus doesn't say. Notice what Jesus doesn't say. Jesus could have said a thousand things to Peter in this moment after he felt betrayed, after he denied him. Let me just mention a few things that Jesus doesn't say. Jesus doesn't look at Peter and say, I told you so. I mean, I told you. I told you that you were going to deny me. You swore up and down that you would not deny me. I told you. you, you I told you three times before the rooster crowed, and you wouldn't believe me. You know, he doesn't say that. What else doesn't he say? Jesus doesn't look at him and say, you know what, Peter? That was real, and that hurt me. He doesn't say that either. I mean, Jesus was utterly betrayed, not just by Peter, but by the whole flock of them, right? But Jesus is not focused on being able to show his knowledge that he knew something that others knew and wouldn't listen to. He's not interested in showing his own self, you know, and to focus on himself. That's not where Jesus is at. Jesus is completely focused on these disciples. Here's another thing he doesn't say. He doesn't say, man, you blew it. I mean, you royally blew it. And you really, really disappointed me, Peter. I looked at you like you're the leader of the bunch and you blew it. Doesn't say that. By the way, to me, that would be focusing on, I guess, maybe Jesus' disappointment. Jesus isn't focused on that. By the way, if every one of us, when we messed up, God looked at us and say, oh, you blew it. He would do that all the time, right? The Bible says in Romans 3, there is no one righteous, not even one. All have turned away. I am so thankful. I'm so thankful. But God doesn't, when we blow it, he doesn't just look and say, oh, you're useless. You'll never be used again. That was one too many times. Now you're useless. Here's the epiphany for me. When I begin to think about what's not said that Jesus didn't say, all of a sudden I realize something. Not only is that the way he works with Peter, every time that I've needed a reset, Every time that I've needed a recall, every time when I had blown it and I needed to be put back on the right track again, he didn't say those things to me. He doesn't say those things to you. He doesn't come and say, man, did you mess up royally? You really did it this time, right? God, when we come in our sinfulness and in our, in our need to be fixed because we're broken, he never looks at us and goes, oh, you're useless now. Oh, I'm so disappointed. Oh, you really, really hurt me. That's not what God does at all. So it, it, it means that we should listen here because he doesn't do that thing. He doesn't say those words. Jesus doesn't condemn Peter in this moment. You hear that? There's one scripture that says, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who have been found in Jesus Christ. Jesus doesn't condemn Peter. And when you come to him in your moment of failure, he doesn't condemn you either. That's not the way it works. What does Jesus do? What does he say? He makes it personal. He says, do you love me? Yes, I love you, Jesus. Do something for me, oh 
Okay. Don't miss that. Don't miss that. <laughs> you got to get this. Peter could have been doing a million things. What was he doing? He'd gone back to fishing. When times are tough, when we get really low, when our spiritual lives are doobie down, 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 right? We will oftentimes default back to what we know. And that's what Peter's done. Jesus is looking at him and say, I, you know, I told you to follow me and I've called you to fish for people, not fish out here in this lake. It was as if Jesus was saying, do you love me? If you love me, then you'll feed my people. I love to think of this as the moment where he was, Jesus was also kind of saying, and by the way, you're not a great fisherman, right? All night long you hadn't caught a thing. Well, don't do this. I've been training you for three years. Follow me. Follow me. Notice what Jesus doesn't say, and notice what Jesus does say. It's this beautiful invitation to step back into discipleship, step back into following me, step back into walking with me, talking with me. Just because you blew it, it doesn't, doesn't seal the deal. There's still so much for you to do. One more thing I want you to notice about this passage that we can learn from it. I want you to notice that Jesus is the initiator of this moment. That Jesus is the initiator. It's not Peter that starts this moment. Peter's just out there being fruitless during the night on a fishing boat, right? It's Jesus who initiates the recall of this relationship. Why is that very important? Guys, John Wesley said it this way. That God reaches out to us, but we are utterly depraved. And if it were not for God's grace in part us, we wouldn't even be able to respond. The idea is that God is the initiator of all relationship. God is always the initiator of covenant. God is always the initiator of forgiveness. And so what, what we see in this picture that, that Jesus is initiating a recall moment. Jesus is acting. The Bible says it this way in Romans. But God demonstrates his own love for us while we were still sinners, that's helplessly lost, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, I think there's so many people, even whole denominations have been built around people, about what they do, what, what they're doing, their response. Some, some people even make baptism about how somebody's choosing to be baptized. I, I want to be baptized, guys. Hear me on this. Theologically, we believe that God initiates all relationship. And anything we ever do is just simply a response to he, what he has already done. We love, why? Because God first loved us. This picture, this is a beautiful picture of how God is working behind the scenes, drawing us, wooing us, calling us to himself, even before we recognize how desperately we need him. Pastor Stephen, how does that happen? I mean, I've been in this moment where, I, where my faith felt low and my, my spirit life felt cold. And, and I felt kind of like my prayers hit a concrete ceiling and I desperately wanted to rekindle my relationship with God, but I didn't know how. How does he work? How does he call me back to himself? It's no different than Peter. Sometimes it's through a situation, sometimes it's through a circumstance, sometimes it's through a person, sometimes it's through an event, sometimes it can be through a sermon, like right now, where you might feel like you're the only person in the room and God's speaking to you. Can I tell you, I've been a Christian since I was 11 years of age, gave my life to Jesus when I was 11, called to the ministry at 13 years of age. And I'd love to tell you that my journey has been this wonderful straight line, but it hasn't. It hasn't. I've zigged and I've zagged and over and over again, God has been faithful, calling me back to his side. And understand it, it's been vastly more about what God was doing to call me back, pull me back, rekindle me back into relationship than anything I ever did. I was simply by his grace responding to what he already did. So it can be through a million ways. You could stand on the edge of an ocean or see a sunrise or a sunset and all of a sudden be just overwhelmed with the warmth of the love of God and the reminder that God loves you. I meet people all the time and they say, Pastor Stephen, I, I, I just feel so far away. How can I come back to God? This is a beautiful picture. 
Realize that he is searching for you, longing for you, going after you. So let's get into the house real quickly. And I'm going to go a little bit faster, okay? What do I need to do to experience a God recall? If you find yourself in Peter's place, just two simple thoughts I want to give you this morning. And the first one is this. Write this one down. Remember. Remember where God's met you in the past. Remember what God's done for you in the past. Remember those moments where he was so intimate and close to you. Remember those moments. The scripture that I provided for you there is Luke chapter 5. And it's, it's the moment that Peter met Jesus. Maybe you remember the story, right? Jesus was teaching on the beach. Jesus needs to get out in the water because so many people are there. He looks at Peter and he says, I need to borrow your boat. And he gets in the boat with Peter. He says, put out in the water. Peter says, yes. And they put out together. Jesus, and Peter's never seen this rabbi before, right? But all of a sudden, after he teaches for a while, Jesus does a miracle. He says, drop down the nets. Peter looks at him and says, we haven't caught anything. I told you Peter was a bad fisherman. We haven't caught anything. And then all of a sudden, when the nets are filled with fish, if you remember the story, Peter falls on his knees and he says, go away from me. From I'm an unholy man. And Jesus says to him, follow me. From this moment forward, you won't fish for fish. You'll fish for people. Notice this. Now listen. Notice this. In Peter's recall moment, Jesus does the same type of miracle to remind him of where he began and where he is today, right? It's this beautiful, this beautiful echo of the miraculous catch of fish early on when they first met each other and then later on when Peter so desperately needs to be recalled and redirected and rekindled. I would say to you, there have been so many times in my life where I just needed to lean back into my past and remember what God had done, to remember those moments and ask for him to do those things in my life again. Remember, the power of memory is strong. Did you know that 352 times in the Bible is the word remember? 352 times the Bible says remember. If you actually use a variant of the word remember, it's more than, more than 550 times that God says, remember, remember. Guys, there is power in memory. But not only that, don't, don't just remember. You want to recall? You reestablish, write that one down. You reestablish relationship. You reestablish relationship. You do something. Peter said, do you love, Jesus said, do you love me? Feed my sheep. So you want to you wanna really see that that rekindling of your soul, that fire reborn inside of you, you do something. You begin to serve. You begin to feed. You begin to love. You begin to read. You begin to pray. You begin to pursue. You begin to talk. When Peter understood that he was forgiven and he understood Jesus was saying, I can still use you. Let's go. Go feed my sheep. Tim, tend my lambs. Oh, the game was on. Peter would become the leader of the church in Jerusalem. One of the most persecuted spots of all the new Christianity. Peter would become a strong leader, but he needed to be reminded that he was loved. And he needed to be reminded that he was forgiven. And then out of that, he began to serve. Church, I just want to remind you of a couple of things here today. God loves you. You are eternally loved. The question from this scripture is, do you love Jesus? If you do, feed his lambs, tend his sheep. And in so doing, even in your actions, you will meet Christ. Let's pray together. God, there's not a one of us in the room who hasn't needed a recall moment. There's not a one of us in the room who hasn't needed a moment to be refired, rekindled, and had our relationship with you reestablished. God, you're speaking this over us today because we need to hear of your love and your call to go follow you into our world. Oh, Jesus, be strong and real to us and help us to share you with the world. Help us to be faithful followers of you who understand that, Lord, we cannot blow it enough where you will say, I'm done with you. That you're not interested in our disappointments or our failures. What you're interested in is calling us to follow you and to walk in your forgiveness. May it be so with each and every one of us, Jesus. Give us your spirit and help us follow you boldly. We pray this in your most holy name, Jesus. Amen.